especially if they're, you know, both obviously both straightened down. So he says, look, if, if that's what you're thinking, he says, you know, then don't just come into this life for that. And he says, it's a treacherous life, my son, and it's not a life that a father would want to bring his son into. Please, you know, you got to promise me I bring you into this life that you have to listen, you know, do as I say, not as I do. Do you have an agreement? Yes. And, you know, that's when I started going up to the club. It was history from there. And I started getting introduced to everybody. And uh, it, was a very, it was a very proud moment for me and for him, I believe. It was kind of a bittersweet moment for him. He was so proud of me graduating. But at the same time, I think I heard him by telling him that I didn't want to go to school anymore. So. How long did you then run with organized crime after, after that? Oh, shit. Um, he probably started bringing me around 11th Avenue. Um, I was probably about 11 or 12. Uh, maybe when I was about 16. That's when the older guys, the old, they used to hang around, play cars and smoke cigars and stuff. They would school me, you know. Um, my father used to teach me when I was young, when he first started bringing me around, is you just, just watch. Walk in the room, evaluate the room. See where everything is. He used to test me. Like he would, he would send me into a room, a random room that I've never seen before. He'd give me about thirty seconds and tell me to come out. And then he would ask me, you know, what did you just see? Where was this chair? Where was this person sitting? What was this guy wearing? And he would put me. He put me through drills like that. And um, once I think he started doing stuff like that is when I realized that. He figured that, look, if my son is going to be involved in this life, he might as well learn from someone who knows it and who knows it well, which was him. So I was his. I belonged to him. You know, that's where my, my honor and loyalty died. It died with him. When did you realize that your father was a hitman? Oh, geez. Um, I remember, well, you know what? This is more, I was being told in the early 70s my father was arrested for a murder that he beat. Um, probably, I would say, let's see, Bicentennial was, what, 76? So yeah. I, I want to say I was about, um, about, about the same time I could tell you, about 11 or 12, when I realized. I didn't, I didn't use that terminology. I, as a hitman, I used more, the term to me was he was a, no people use the word gangster, but to me, I always use he's a man's man. When I would use that terminology to to people in my circle, people understood what I meant. You know, the average person, if you say a guy's a man's man, they're going to think he's homosexual. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so probably I was about 11 or 12 when I realized that he was the type of guy that, you know, people feared. And I noticed it, and I noticed the respect they gave him. And um, yeah, I was I was young. I was young, Luke, very young. Did it ever make you love him any less that once you started suspecting that your father was a? You know, no, um, absolutely not. Matter of fact, I. Um, it's kind of funny, um, Luke, that you say that because you know the average person, you know, in the world you know, knows the difference between right and wrong, let's say. And even though that I knew that the life that he lived was wrong, I convinced myself it was right. So that meant that I would do anything, um, meaning if I had to follow, follow him into the gates of hell, I'm with you, you know. He, he was my guy, and he was the only guy, he was worried about me because... He, he was the only guy that I would take orders from. Uh, you know, I met a lot of guys in my life. There was two men that I that I ever only respected in that life. There's probably a couple more, but the first two that, that stand out, obviously number one is my father, and two was John Gotti. When I was in his presence, it was, it was, it's a feeling that I cannot describe to you, Lou, to be able to sit down and laugh and joke and talk sports and play cards with a guy like John Gotti. And, even fully knowing, you know, what he did and what people say about him, I I wasn't one to judge. I thought it was I thought it was the right way to live. 
You know, I really just I just thought everything was right. I thought I thought the law was wrong, cops were wrong, agents were wrong. They they were doing the bad, wrong thing, and we were the good guys. You know, um, <clears throat> my father had given me a quote when I first asked him a question. Um, I don't want to leap on you, but quick. Um, he used to make us go to church every Sunday, and. One Sunday uh, after church, um, I turned around and I said to him, I said, you know, Pop, I said, um, you, know, we, you know, we do what we do, you know, Monday through Saturday, and then Sunday we come to church, and, you know, what, what are we forgiving for everything that we did? I said, you know, it, it makes me feel very hypocritical. I don't understand this whole going to church thing. And he had turned around and told me, he's like, well, he's like, um, it's kind of like that Santa Claus thing, you know, we're children, you know. They believe in him, but they never seen him. It's like people with God. People never seen him, but they believe in him. So, you know, his his point of view for me was, um, I feel like I went off track on you for a second there, but No, keep going, keep going, yeah, I understand. He, I just I think he was more worried about me because he knew that I was the only he was the only person that I listened to. And I tried told him that time and time again. I was like, Pop, if, you know, if the day ever comes, and, and he used to tell me, if you want me to wear the Pop hat, the Father hat, let me know, I'll wear that hat. If you want me to wear, you know, the Skipper hat, I'll put the Skipper hat on. You know, how do you want to talk? You want to talk business or are we talking personal family business? And, you know, he gave me that opportunity to speak. So, you know, he was afraid for me. He's like, you know, if, if and when, you know, your number gets called, you know, and it may be soon. He's like, I'm worried about you. He's like, you're too much of a cowboy, you know. And he's like, the hardest thing in life, he used to call me Willie. He's like, the hardest thing in life, Willie, is to bury a child. And you, you scare me. You make me think that I'm going to want to bury my son. Okay. And I told, I just, I thought I told him, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm out there. Yeah, people know I'm your son. But I'm out there. I can handle myself. I know what I'm doing. You know, and uh, that worked. It worked very well for a long time. We had a very good relationship for a very long time because of that. How how long did you run with with uh, organized crime and with your father for? Um, I probably started getting serious about it. Probably I want to say about six, fifteen or sixteen years old. I started to come up every Wednesday night. We had to be there at. Uh, I believe at the time it was seven shop, you couldn't be late, and every Saturday you had to be there by noon, and it was mandatory. If you didn't show up, you better have, next time you showed up, you better had have or had someone call for you or get a message to my father somehow with a good reason why you didn't show up. So I was about 16, 17 when I started fully, uh, you know, being around guys and, you know, learning things, you know, learning how to Shylock, and I, you know, learning what big was and, you know, just the whole lingo. You know, I just, I sat and I, it was like a sponge. I just absorbed it all. I just, I just took it all in, you know. Um, and it came easy to me. It came very easy to me. Um, my One problem that I did have is that I, have a, I had a soft heart. And, you know, there was one instance where, you know, um, we had to go out and collect some money um, from this guy that uh, just kept putting us off, putting us off. And, you know, we wound up hurting the guy. The guy wound up having a family. And the guy was, after we hurt him, he was paralyzed, you know, from the right side down for the rest of his life. And, you know, after that happened, I felt horrible because I knew his wife, I knew his son, I knew his daughter. And, you know, even though I wasn't the one who actually swung the bat, but I was there to make sure it got done, so I'm just as guilty. So I started to realize that I did have a heart, you know. So my main, my, my main concern started to be just my father's trust. You know, you need to go somewhere, I'm there. You know, if you need someone to stand outside, you know, while you're inside talking, I'm there. Um, whatever it might be. And, you know, it became more than that. You know, I started to learn more and more, and then when he went to jail um, in, I think it was 94, uh, for about 13 months, I started handling, like, all his stuff, and I, in me, myself, I was like, I don't know how this guy does it. I mean, I was completely 
I was completely blown away. I 